Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your son to the cross. Lord, thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And thank you for your patience, God, as you did all of these things. Lord, as we come to your table this morning, Lord, help us um, just have a clear vision of who you are. Lord, help us to worship you well during this time. In your name, amen. Hi, thank you for being here today. Um, I've been looking forward to this time all week as we come and prepare our hearts for communion. Um, we're going to be looking at a couple of verses in 1 Timothy. Um, and so if you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand. There are men here that would love to put one in your hand. Um, and if you need that Bible to keep, it is our gift to you. Before we read from 1 Timothy, let me give you a little bit of background about what I want to talk about in these verses. My small group has been going through the attributes of God uh, for most of the year. And this last week, we talked about God's patience. This attribute is stunning to me because God has shown patience with his creation in ways I don't think any of us really understand and I don't think we even really take the time to think about. Um, so I want to think about that this morning. Um, and let's start by defining the word. This word has many different definitions depending on the context and the application. So today what I want to look at specifically is God's patience. His patience differs from mine. If you were to define my patience, you would probably do something like this. You would say, Matt's patience is his ability to take punishment or take something that was wronged from people or circumstances without losing his temper, without becoming irritated or angry. That's not God's patience. God's patience is very different. It's on a completely different level because he is constantly having evil people sin against him. God's patience can best be defined as long-suffering. The Bible oftentimes uses the phrase steadfastness or even God's steadfast love when it's describing his patience. He is not trying to control his temper. He is steadfastly withholding his wrath, which we all deserve. For example, let's look at the story of Noah. God decided to wipe out mankind because Genesis 6-5 tells us that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. But he chose Noah's family to save. Then, over a hundred years later, the floods came. Do you think man shaped up during that hundred years? Do you think what God saw wasn't there for that hundred years? No. No, God waited and patiently waited. First Peter 3.20 says, the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. There are many things to learn about God from the story of Noah, and his patience is definitely one of them. God saw the wickedness of man and needed to expunge mankind from the earth, but steadfastly withheld his wrath for over a hundred years to save just enough so that his perfect plan could take shape a few thousand years later. Which brings us to 1 Timothy. Open your Bibles up to 1 Timothy 1, and we will be looking at verses 15 through 17. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king of eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The trustworthy statement is that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But Paul isn't just struck with this statement. He is struck with how God saved him. And like Paul, I want to look at that part of this section. Paul called himself the foremost sinner twice in these two verses. He is literally saying the worst. Paul is saying, I am the worst sinner in the world. Do you think he really believed that? I do. I think he saw his life before Christ and thought, there is nothing anyone could do against God that is worse than what I did. John MacArthur describes Paul this way. He says, I think he said he was the worst because he probably was the worst. I mean, how bad can you be 
but be a mass murder of people who love Jesus Christ. From a human viewpoint, he was wretched. He was a blasphemer of God and Christ. He was a killer of Christians, and he did it all for the sheer joy of watching people suffer. Now that's a perverted mind. So when he says, I am the first, and uses the emphatic pronoun, and the word first, he means he was a wretched, vile sinner of massive proportions. Then verse 16 says, I found mercy. And let me tell you why I found mercy. Jesus Christ saved Paul to demonstrate his patience, perfect patience. God allowed Paul to persecute the church in patience, so he could not give Paul the justice he deserved, but so that he could save him. This wasn't just withholding of wrath, but this became a pouring out of love. God's patience in saving sinners is so much more than withholding wrath. Once again, MacArthur makes a beautiful point. Do you know why God saved Paul? You say to keep him out of hell? No, that was a benefit. You say to get him to heaven? No, that was a benefit. You say to have him write the epistles? No, nah, he could have had anyone do that. To preach? He could have had anyone do that. Well, why did he save Paul? Save Paul. God saved Paul because God wanted to save the world's worst pagan and make him the world's greatest Christian. Why? And here it is. To show the power of grace. To put himself on display. You see, the purpose of salvation is to glorify God, to demonstrate his power and his patience. Paul explains this and immediately praises God for it. Verse 17, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. As we remember that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, as we remember that he saved the worst sinner, we need to worship him this morning. Also, think of a person you know that is not a believer. The flat fact they're in your life and on this earth is an act of patience on God's part. He is withholding his wrath from them. Do not let that go. Insert yourself into their life and bring the gospel to them. Help them see how patient God is being with them. If you're here this morning and you are one of those who doesn't put your faith in Jesus to save you from your sins, I want to speak to you for a minute. Maybe you've thought, well, he can't save me. I'm too far gone. Let me fix these things in my life first, then I'll be able to talk to God. That's false thinking. Have you systematically murdered Christians and put them in jail? God was patient with one that did. The fact that you're here listening to this message and hearing about God's patience is in fact an example of how God is showing his patience towards you. So I plead with you, rest in his attributes. Remember verse 15, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He went to the cross to bear the punishment for your sins regardless of what those sins are. He asks you to believe in him for eternal life. Put your faith in him, and he will forgive those sins. And he does that. You can do that right now. However, if you do not do that, please let the cup and bread pass. This time of communion is a time of worship reserved for those who put their trust in Jesus. Men, can you please serve us? Take communion on your own, and I'll come back and close this in prayer. <clears throat>